Hi, I'm James Patrick, the director of Big Picture. We caught up with David Bell in Portugal, who's a career global public health policy guy. He's worked for a number of Gates organizations, and he provides perspective on the COVID narratives, the lockdowns, and what the hell went on during this whole COVID period. He talks to us about the logic of epidemiology, natural immunity versus vaccine immunity, and gives us policy recommendations from an experienced veteran. The best recommendation he has to give is tell the truth. I'm David Bell, I'm a public health physician with a PhD in um, population health and disease modelling. Worked in the World Health Organization for about eight years in malaria, a little bit on the SARS-1 outbreak early on, and then worked in a foundation in Geneva in diagnostic development and for a, a Gates-owned entity uh, lab where I was director of global health technologies for a few years just out of Seattle. So I now work in biotech and global health. The WHO, the World Health Organization, they define health as physical, mental and social. This is sort of more the social bit of, or the interaction between human behavior in populations and diseases. I've worked on infectious disease and outbreaks and epidemics for 20 years or more. And I, I know quite a bit of the back, you know, the way that WHO works and other large NGOs and funders work and so on. I've been in that world. I thought in January 2020 something was going to go wrong. The, the idea of a pandemic and a virus was sort of knocking around from China. I mean, public health can be pretty boring. A lot of it can be like, you know, you, you just go to meetings and you, you talk about what you talked about before. You're investigating a diarrhea outbreak in a restaurant or something. And the idea of a pandemic just excites a lot of people. So people have been waiting for the pandemic and preparing for it for a long time because it's one of the more interesting things. People want, almost want this, uh, <laughs> professionally, a lot of people. People have been sort of preparing for a pandemic for a long time in the background. It's inappropriate if you look at disease burden and what actually kills people. But it's not odd in that people like excitement and People are funding that area, so people want to work in it. It's not, not, it's not criminal to be excited by something. It's bad for the health of others if you're diverting money from stuff that's killing a lot of people, harming a lot of people, to something which is not going to do that, but which is just interesting for you to work on. It's not technically criminal, but it's, it's at least a betrayal of the people that you're supposed to be helping. Or it was published in March that, you know, out of China, the data that was published in Lancet that this was a disease of old people and very rare, very rarely severe in young people. And Imperial College even published that data at the same time that they were producing these models suggesting we were all going to die. The idea of a lockdown and it was to flatten the curve to get the ICUs ready, okay, that might make sense, although we've never done it before. It might make sense for one or two weeks if this was really bad. It wasn't that bad. As soon as you start locking, you know, lockdown is a criminal term. It, it, you use it for in prisons. It's never been, it's not a public health term until 2020. So there's a whole new term. So you sort of think, what's going on here? They're, they're making up terms for this. If you stop people getting screened, you take them out of their jobs and you impoverish them, you, et cetera, you close schools and so on, then you're doing harm. Anything in public health, you're weighing the benefits versus the harms. But the whole narrative that we were hearing was just benefits of lockdowns, benefits of lockdowns. And no one was pointing out, if you stop screening people for cancer, you get more people dropping dead from cancer. Yeah. No, it's not complicated. The average person can work this out. But no one in health was talking about it, no one in medicine. And trying to publish this stuff, you found that almost no one wanted to publish it, but they were publishing really inappropriate stuff on the number of people that were going to die from COVID, which is obviously untrue, and the modelling out of Imperial was poor modelling. As soon as you start infecting people, they become immune, then you're taking those people out of the population of susceptible people. So the next person has a few less people to infect, and the next one a few less. The more susceptible people are hit first, whether it's behavioural or whatever and then the less susceptible. So your spread tends to reduce from the first person onwards. So it looks like the curve's going up, but the rate of increase is, is slowing. It's hitting the people who are hardest to infect and the reproductive rate drops and 
it, it goes away. And that's always going to, it's always happened in every outbreak, it's always going to happen. It was clear from the very beginning that, or very early, that healthy, fit taxpayers were not going to be dying in large numbers of COVID. So taking all these taxpayers out of the equation, forcing them to stay home, while you're instituting un you know, unusually expensive responses, mass responses, uh, is not, it's not making sense. You know, you've got to keep society running for public health reasons. You've got to fund your health service. In a pandemic, you need to try to keep people calm and relatively normal and stop panic. But we had this clear push to make, to spread panic and spread fear, which is the inappropriate, you know, it's the opposite of a good public health response. Yeah. Public health, you should inform people accurately what is going on and inform them of the best options and allow them to make a decision on how they deal with it. A well-informed decision, that's what public health is supposed to do. If you look at low-income countries, this is even worse because the population is younger, they're far less likely to be harmed by COVID, which we, we, is what we're seeing in reality, and they have less obesity and other comorbidities. But they have far higher burdens of other infectious diseases, which will very quickly go up if you close down health services and impoverish people. So, you know, all the harms that you see, you're going to see in high income countries are much worse in low income countries. But we were translating the same response that we were forcing on Northern Italy on Africa. And, you know, that, that's, it's just, it's ridiculous because they're very different populations, very different behaviours, very different disease burdens. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, if you work in global health, you know, the main indicator, the main cause of poor health in these countries is poverty. And if you reduce the GDP, you kill more people, especially more children. If you increase the GDP, improve it, and you improve supply lines and so on, then you save people. So the last thing you do in a public health response is close down the economy so that you reduce the GDP, you know, and increase poverty and stop supply lines for drugs and diagnostics, which is the main reason people die. It's not because of the disease. It's because they don't get diagnosed and treated soon enough. Take malaria, for instance, which you know, kills 600,000 more children every year. Um, the, the main reasons people die of malaria, we have good drugs, we have good diagnostics. The main reasons people die of malaria is because they are too late in being diagnosed and treated. They get a fever, it's three or four days till they get to the clinic, by then they've got severe malaria and they die. If you diagnose them within 24, 48 hours and you treat them with the appropriate drugs, they'll virtually always get better. It's highly dependent on having rapid access to these cheap diagnostics and drugs. If you close down that society, you say people can't travel, you close the clinic, you will inevitably increase malaria. All these are tied to, to some extent, to nutrition. If, if you have increased poverty, you have more malnutrition that increases infectious diseases. You, know, you close all that down because of a disease that's going to kill people over 70, which in sub-Saharan Africa is less than about 1% of the population, then you know, it's an insane thing to do. It's just completely inappropriate from a public health point of view. So when you see that happening, you know that this isn't a, a legitimate public health response. So then you start thinking, what on earth is going on? And, you know, there, there are different theories in that. It's, it's inarguable that it's a poor public health response. You know, what is driving it? There are a lot of theories and so on. I, I mean, to me, try to go for the most simple explanation. And in a way, it's a very large sort of business transaction. Uh, we've had increasing private funding of global public health. And, that, you know, ostensibly that seems a good thing. Uh, more money, more diagnostics and drugs helps people. But if it also comes with strings attached that, okay, but the money will be spent on this area. And we've seen a big increase in vaccine use and vaccine funding, because that's something you can monetize. It's very hard to monetize training more health workers. It's very easy to monetize drugs or vaccines. We've seen this shift from this sort of community-based health that you know, I was sort of trained in to 
a very vertical, centralised approach where a large Western company produces a vaccine and you inject that into all the people. And that's your public health. And that makes a lot of money for the people making the vaccine, but it makes worse the problems of poverty, etc., which are really the underlying causes of why these people are at risk at all. Living conditions are a big part of disease. We improve living conditions, we improve nutrition over the last hundred years in the West, and that has had a big impact on reducing childhood mortality from infectious disease. Vaccines have come in on top of that and they've helped. Childhood vaccination is important in these countries, but it has to be in the context of being one of an array of approaches and the most important approach in the long term is trying to improve their ability to improve their own living standards and accommodation and nutrition. So that's all going backwards. You know, some countries have had kids out of school for one or one and a half years. That means that the whole next generation is going to have more poverty. So we have locked in now over two years of lockdowns, we have locked in a generation or two of increased poverty with all the disease burden and death that goes with that, especially for children. We've added another 10 million girls to child marriage. Um, we've increased child labour by kicking all these kids out of school. We've increased teenage pregnancy and rape. Mm -hmm. We knew that this was a result. We've seen this before with influenza where, you know, you can get um, bad influenza outbreaks every three or four years and you, they can have the tent in the car park or you can have people waiting two, three days in the emergency department because there's so many cases. That happens in hospitals every now and then because we run hospitals with a fairly minimum spare capacity because it's more efficient. And we know that every now and then you get a respiratory virus outbreak, you'll be very busy. So COVID, I think, was like that. The hospitals were very busy for a short time. Overall, in the US and the UK, I think there was less bed use in 2020 than there normally is. That's not what happens in a bad pandemic. In a bad pandemic, you end up having way more people going through the hospital. In 2020, we had less in most Western countries. They closed other beds, they closed down screening, they closed down, in some countries closed down a lot of their like chemotherapy for cancer. So, of course, more people die of cancer. That's not rocket science. Like the New York Times every day had a headline, you know, a big number in bold print of the number of people who died. And they never said half of these people were over 80. Or, you know, yeah, but it was nearly all people with metabolic disease who had only another year or two to live. Or, um, or even 600 died, but this is out of this many. And compare it with, say, 2018-19 flu season, and it's not much different. They, we never got that. We only got a bold number, completely out of context. There was so much panic, and I think induced panic and fear in these sort of headlines then that you can't in a way blame those stuff. I mean, we're all human, and we're all susceptible to fear, and we can all be irrational when, we, when we're fearful. Medical staff, health staff are no different from other humans, so people can panic. A lot of people, they lost this ability to, um, you know, to process data in a, in a sort of rational, calm way. Public health is supposed to be about risk and benefit and where is the calculations here of is the benefit of lockdowns going to outweigh the risk? There is all this really inappropriate stuff being published saying, you know, suddenly mass work for viruses, for aerosolized viruses. Even though, you know, at the same time, say CDC put out a study in their meta-analysis of masks came out in, I think, May 2020, in the middle of instituting the mask mandates, that said, that showed that for influenza, which is a pretty similar sized virus, that masks make no difference. Anyone who's pointing out this stuff was sort of vilified you know, you're killing grandma, you're going to kill more people. No, you're not. We were instituting these measures that were, weren't in any public health textbook and that there was a lot of evidence would be harmful without any debate on are they really going to help and there's no evidence that they would help. You shouldn't be viewed as a bad person for sitting there and saying, well, what's the best way to stop 
to, to get the maximum number of people to survive. Even if it's a really bad pandemic, you should be able to say, well, if we locked everyone down, which is this new term, is that going to kill more people or save more people? Let's sit down and figure that out and then do the one that kills the least people. But that never happened. We already knew the virus overwhelmingly hits very old people and very old sick people. And very old sick people are not going to live very long. We normally talk about in public health disease burden as um, we call it daily disability adjusted life years or qualities, it's quality adjusted life years. And this is, you look at when someone dies or is severely disabled, how many good life years do they lose? So a five-year-old dying from malaria might lose 70 years of life. An uh, 85-year-old dying from pneumonia might lose one year of life. There are two deaths and a death is a death. But normally you would put your resources and the emphasis on the five-year-old who just lost 70 years rather than the one who might lose one year. Now, it's not saying you want the 85-year-old to die. It's just saying we have this resources. How do we have the best impact? And probably that 85-year-old would prefer they die a little bit earlier and their grandchild has another 70 years of life, if you ask them. If you do that for COVID, I mean, at the back of an envelope will tell you COVID's not going to be, it's not going to rate on the hierarchy of important diseases because most of the people who die would have died in a year or two. Not all of them, but most of them. All the data is on mortality. And of course, you know, the way we measure mortality was pretty new because it, you didn't even have to have been sick with COVID. You just had a positive test and whatever you died from, you were a COVID death. So that, that was clearly wrong. I mean, it's just... I think that is malfeasance to do that. But then to measure disease burden on mortality rather than on these other metrics that take into account how old was the person when they died, that's just really bad public health. It's the wrong way to allocate, to allocate health resources. I only know two papers looking at disease burden in terms of, for COVID, in terms of life years lost, and I, I was co-author on both of those papers and they were looking at the African context. I mean COVID doesn't even rate on mortality in Africa but if you do life years lost it almost disappears. I talked to people at prominent research institutions, modelers, about doing this and I mean one of them said to me up front you know they they'd done the back of envelope calculation and they couldn't help because COVID wouldn't rate and that was, would be a problem if they were part of writing about that. The reason was because their main funding came from places that were very strongly pushing the COVID narrative, lockdown, wait for a vaccine, etc. If you look at nor their normal metrics for disease burden, COVID's much less important than these other 15, 20 diseases. That, that would be very potentially bad for their future funding. It is clearly wrong to push for the idea of lockdowns like this, for a disease like this, and especially in low-income countries. It's clear. The WHO is a big organisation. I mean, they produced very good modelling early on on what would, could happen to malaria TB early 2020. They published on very significant concerns of what happens if you reduce supply lines, etc. You reduce bed net um, distribution and so on for malaria. So there are people there who are worried and could see this. UNICEF have also produced very good data on the, the harms that have been done and the harms that are going to be done. The COVID part, I think, has clearly gone off the rails. And it, that's most apparent now in their push for vaccination in low-income countries. So sub-Saharan Africa, only 1% of the population is over 70 or 75. Half the population is under 20. The WHO's own studies have shown that before, even before Omicron, that most people in Africa were immune, had immunity to COVID. They'd already had the disease. We know from CDC data and other that natural, you know, post-infection immunity to COVID is as good or better than the vaccine and lasts a lot longer. Even if you believe a lockdown is, was useful in Northern Italy, which I, I, you know, I don't, but if you believe that, it doesn't, you don't take that and stick it in Uganda or Burkina Faso or Malawi. It doesn't make any sense at all. It's almost, it's an sort of colonialist mentality. 
you tailor the response to the needs of the population. So even if it's a bad disease, if they have three or four or five worst diseases, you still concentrate on the worst diseases. I mean, WHO, they're very careful when they're wording. They, WHO doesn't order people to lock down. They're trying to get it under international law that countries will have to follow the Director General more closely. That'll still be up to the countries whether they do that or not, but it can be very hard for low-income countries that don't have much financial weight to stand against that. Uh, they carry a lot of sort of moral and persuasive weight. A lot of it is just the influence of funding and the change in funding. Most WHO funding now is not core funding, it's funding given by a funder and increasingly private sources for a specific um, program, a specific disease, a specific output. So the WHO, to a large extent, can't even choose where its priorities are now. It, it has to do what the funders tell it. And you know, it could refuse the funding, but then it would have to, a lot of staff would lose their jobs. So inevitably you end up changing your program to suit what the funders want, rather than what you might think the main need is. An example of the um, this sort of conflict of interest and the private influence, I think, is the, the COVID mass vaccination policy. You have this push, which is unprecedented in the, the amount of money. We've never funded a public health program internationally like this before. It, you know, the, the COVAX program has already had more than twice the annual budget of WHO, and they're after a lot more money for it. You know, Yale estimates just to vaccinate everyone in low and middle income countries one, you know, with two, vac two doses would be about $35 billion, which is about 10 years of the WHO annual budget. They know that most of these people are already immune with good post-infection immunity. They know that most of these people were never susceptible to COVID because very few of them are old. They know that to do this, it will have a huge draw on resources. Someone has to give these vaccines and a lot of these countries, you have one health worker for, say, 5,000 people. So instead of seeing the kids with fever who need rapid treatment for malaria, the health worker is going to be injecting all these people who are already immune and who were never susceptible in the first place with a COVID vaccine. There's a good CDC study showing that if you vaccinate people who've already po had post-infection immunity, there's almost no difference in the rate of severe COVID. So. Um, so it's, it's, we know it's pointless, we know it can't help because these people already have adequate immunity. Uh, so it can't help but it's unprecedentedly expensive. That money goes in the end to vaccine companies who are funding and are involved in funding WHO but also the sort of sister organisations like Gavi and CEPI which are the sort of vaccine alliance and the pandemic alliance that work closely with WHO, they will benefit to a very largely from this. And the people in sub-Saharan Africa who are being injected cannot benefit significantly, but they will have increased burden of other diseases because of this diversion of resources, so they will suffer. They're pushing on the basis of vaccine equity. And there's this twisted idea that there's a lack of equity if you don't inject someone in sub-Saharan Africa with the same stuff you're injecting someone with in the United States or Europe. It's not health equity. It's not they're going to suffer because they're not, because COVID isn't a significant problem in most of sub-Saharan Africa, no problem for most of the people there. So they're not going to benefit. It's not an equity that helps them. It's an equity about there's more injections here than there. You know, there's more commodity there than here. If it was health equity, you'd be saying, gee, well, these people, they have a big problem in the nursing homes with COVID, so we'll give them in COVID vaccination. In Africa, they have a problem with malaria and TB and HIV, so we'll concentrate on those diseases. That will be equity. But they're using the term equity because they think if they use that word, it makes it very hard for people to oppose it because then you're anti-equity, which is like saying someone's racist or something like that. It's a way of trying to silence opposition. And also, I think to stop people thinking, because you start thinking, oh, if it's equity, I, it must be good. They just had some good psychologists who figured out that the, if we do this, it's, we'll sell more vaccines, basically. Uh, it's, it's about selling vaccines and making rich people richer. The, 
the one of the biggest outcomes of the COVID pandemic or you know, event has been a, a shift in wealth from the poorer people of the world to a very small bunch of very rich people. Obviously, that's bad for the world, and it's bad for the vast majority of people in the world. But, and this is just part of that process. It's the opposite of public health. Public health is about, you know, equity is about an equal share and an equal opportunity. You know, good nutrition, lack of stress, um, et cetera, that they're associated with being healthier. And yeah, I mean, that's the thing about lockdown. It's locking people up out of the sun is the last thing you want to do for a respiratory virus. You want people to be fit and healthy and have as strong immune systems as you can. I mean, they say this, um, no one is safe until everyone is safe, which is just a ridiculous statement. Because if, and this is repeated on all the websites of all the organizations, UNICEF, Gavi, uh, World Economic Forum, all that crowd. And you know, no one is safe unless everyone is safe. They're trying to say you have to vaccinate everyone. But they're saying, if you believe that, then no one is safe until everyone is safe. It means if you're vaccinated, you're still not safe. The vaccine doesn't work until someone else is vaccinated. That's it. But they're also trying to say, oh, get vaccinated because it will protect you. you. You can't have both. They're completely contradictory arguments. One thing we do know about the vaccine is that it doesn't stop transmission. So vaccinating other people is not going to protect you even if being vaccinated yourself does. We know post-infection immunity makes you pretty safe. We know that healthy children are safe. We know that healthy young adults are safe. So it's, it's a completely nonsense slogan. It's the underlying slogan for the largest public health campaign in international health campaign in history, the most expensive one. And so that this whole campaign is built on a complete, completely fallacious statement. And if you pull the statement apart, you see that the whole campaign makes no sense. Yeah, do it for grandma. Yeah. It's an interesting one because for first, um, the international rights of the child says that the child's welfare has to be paramount. And most countries have signed up to that. So if you're saying you should put the child at some risk to protect an adult, that is directly against the international rights of the child. There's good studies showing if old people live in houses with children, they have a slightly lower mortality from COVID than old people who live on their own with other old people. And then there's a probable reason for that because children, they have a much lower viral load if they get COVID. So they transmit much lower viral load. So old people who get infected from children are better off than old people who get infected from old people because they get less viral load infecting them so they have more time to build up their immunity and overcome it. You know, once you've had it once, you're probably better off getting it reasonably frequently because that will keep your immune system boosted rather than getting it six variants down the road where your post-infection immunity is not as good against that new variant. So this virus has evolved. So uh, humans have evolved to live with respiratory viruses and to live with, you know, the other coronaviruses circulate through the community all the time. The, the, there's four common coronaviruses that cold, cause colds. One of the reasons they just call it, cause a cold in us and don't actually kill us is because we have been in contact with them mostly since we were very young children and we keep getting boosted. And human immunity has evolved over millions of years to be that way, to cope, to live with these viruses. So mm -hmm. suddenly isolating people and preventing them from being naturally boosted is, is not a very smart thing to do. There will be more pandemics declared. So pandemics are very rare. There was one in 1918-19, the Spanish flu. There was a flu pandemic, 57-58, one in 68-69 when we had Woodstock. You know, life went on as normal. But there was a pandemic that killed a million people. And then, you know, there wasn't, there was a pseudo pandemic in 2009, which was swine flu, which killed less people than the flu normally kills each year. That's it for the last century. So they're rare events. Um, we will have more pandemics, I think, going forward because 
the definition of a pandemic now is it doesn't even have to kill anyone. It's just the definition of WHO is a, it's a disease, a, a sort of new disease, new issue, also a new pathogen that spreads across international borders. It's a pandemic. So yeah, they're, they're going to find more. So they're doing more surveillance. They're going to find more. They will, the virus has always evolved, so they will find more variants. They can say, oh, this variant has the potential to be a pandemic, so we'll lock down this country, we'll vaccinate everyone. It almost certainly won't be a pandemic, and probably the best way to actually prepare for pandemics is to get the population as fit and well as possible. So work on obesity, work on metabolic disease, rather than trying to identify every new viral variant um, suggests that it's going to be severe when statistically it's highly, highly unlikely to be and then increase people's poverty with your response. The way to stop this is to go back to just telling the truth all the time about what's going on and having rational evidence-based discussions where you can actually sit down and think, you know, who is the vaccine beneficial in, who is it probably net harm in figuring out a sensible way of using it. Are lockdowns going to be useful in some situations or not? Having a rational discussion on that and telling the truth about disease burden, about mortality, informing the public when something comes out, you know, who is at risk, who is not at risk, and the harms, potential harms of what they do to try to avoid it and letting them make sensible decisions. So I think going back to just telling the truth and doing something about conflict of interest and private interests influencing the decisions that are supposed to be the public's to make and not private corporations who are going to benefit from it, which is pretty basic and you, it, you know, it's not hard to figure out that getting rid of that will help, but getting rid of that means overcoming very influential, powerful people who have so much money now that they can buy a lot of influence in the media and elsewhere. So it's not, it's an obvious thing to do, but it's not going to be easy.